Okay, good afternoon, everybody. We're going to begin this session. We have three speakers who will each speak for 10 minutes, followed by five minutes for questions and answers. Our first speaker is Connell Cunningham from the National University in Galway. And Connell joined the library in 2012 to manage a project to integrate the library and IT service desks, which he now manages on a day-to-day -day basis. Connell is going to talk about maker spaces and a project to create a maker space at NUIG. Our second speaker is Anya Lynch from the IT in Blanchestown. Anya is responsible for bibliographic services at the IT. And in her talk today, Anya is going to reflect on the use of open books in libraries in, and colleges and universities, in, mainly in the States, but consider their potential for the use in Irish academic libraries. And our final speaker is Justine Bennett from the University of Limerick. And Justine is the cataloging and metadata librarian there. And she's going to share their experience of conducting a significant cleanup of their catalog records to facilitate collection analysis and make all their records RDA compliant. So I'm going to hand over now to Connell. OK, thank you. OK, so my name is Connell Cunningham. Um, glad to be presenting at my namesake conference. Thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, it's unusual to hear your names, particularly my name is not that common, so it's unusual to hear it over and over again <laughs> all day. Okay, so we're going to talk about what a makerspace is. Now, it's a fairly new term. I only heard about it probably less than a year ago at this stage. So being a library conference, we'll do a, a little definition first of all. Um, it comes from hackerspace, right? So hackerspaces have been around for quite a while. In the last year or so, the hacker bit has been dropped, okay, because it has connotations of people getting into your bank account and all that type of thing. Um, it's also referred to as a hacked lab. Lab is often in, in, in the definition. Uh, also called a hack space, okay, so that one's from Wikipedia. Educause has a better one, really. It says it's a physical location where people gather to share resources and knowledge, work on projects, and network. Now, that sounds like a library to me. They have one word at the end. It says, and build. OK? That's what makes it a makerspace. Sorry. It's a place where mostly informal learning takes place. And I say mostly because initially, there will be some formal training required, OK? Whether it be for staff or for students, in order to learn the technologies that we're, they're going to use. It's hands-on, so it's learning by doing. Failure is allowed, and failure can also be expected, OK? We talk about prototyping. So this is where people come up with an idea, and they come to the makerspace to bring that idea into f to fruition, to make the item. Rapid prototyping is also similar, OK? This is where, with prototyping, you'd be making it, breaking it, making it again, and continuing on in that fashion. With the technology we have today, you can do this very quickly. Makerspaces also have a community aspect to it, okay? So it's people helping other people. So why in an academic library? We have this quote, in theory, theory and practice are the same, in practice they're not, okay? It's attributed to a number of people, but Albert Einstein being one of them. In our universities, we do a lot of teaching. Research takes place all over the, all over the place undergrads as well as postgrads and researchers. There's a lot of group work going on, particularly in the libraries these days. We all know how popular our group rooms are. We're going to add the practice bit, the actual making at the end. Libraries have a history of shared resources. We already share books, OK? It's an obvious place for it. We take expensive equipment and share it. A lot of the equipment we talk about is not available in other places, okay? It's not available to students. We have a goal of getting our students' workplace ready, our life ready, and this is one step towards that. So we took a look at what others are doing. Uh, there's quite a bit of it going on in the States, okay? So we have the Harvard Innovation Lab being one. We've got MIT's Hobby Shop. We've got the Transformative Learning Technologies Lab at Stanford, which used to be called Fab Lab, which I thought was a much better name for it. We have the Shed, which is in the University of Kent. We don't have a name for the Galway one yet, OK? We've been trying to get one. We haven't come up with something catchy. We also have an issue, or a challenge, whereby everything has to be in Irish and English in Galway. 
there is no Irish for makerspace, okay? I've checked with the octave, there isn't one. So we're gonna have to make one up or come up with the name that's the same in Irish and English. And actually, shed is very similar in Irish and English, or can be used, okay? What we've done so far, so we've got approval uh, probably about six months ago at this stage. The idea was put forward through the library. We got some funding from the Students Project Fund. We got some funding from the library and we've actually gone out and got a little bit of sponsorship as well from suppliers. The space is very important for us, right? We need it to be out, out front, visible. We have an area in our foyer that we're going to use, which has a glass uh, window, a large window onto the outside, which has a lot of traffic, okay? We are running into issues with the space, though, so in terms of getting a bit of renovation done, it's, it's proving to be quite expensive, okay? So, we take a look at what did others include in their makerspaces. So we have 3D printers, laser cutters, Raspberry Pis, Arduino boards, PCs, uh, soldering equipment, electronics, little bits, scanners, milling machines, lathes, all sorts of different things, and books, okay? There's an awful lot of stuff. If you think of a makerspace, if you take maker off it, it's a space. You can put anything in it. You get sewing machines, knitting, all sorts of different things, okay? And of course, we can't do all of that. So we had a survey. We put a survey on Vovici. Um, we only got about 60 respondents, which isn't great. We looked at some of the things that we thought were possible to use. So we had 3D printers very high there, Raspberry Pi also very high. We then looked also at when would they use it. So we found that uh, the evening time, right, so we'd be starting work at uh, 5 o'clock and finishing at 10 o'clock, okay? This is when they want to do their maker space. So we decided, okay, with all of that taken on board, we had to be realistic about what we were going to do. We had to look at what we can have in terms of what you can p physically put in the library, what we can afford, and what can we manage. The first two we really concentrated on. We didn't really take the what we can manage bit into account too much. So we looked at what we could have in the library, what we could afford within our budget. And this is what we came up with. So I'll talk a little bit about these different items. So 3D printing is very popular these days, okay? Uh, for those of you that don't know what a 3D printer is, it takes something like what's in your strimmer, you know, that sort of plastic thread string type of stuff, and squeezes it through a hot print head, okay? And it does that in little pieces. So this piece here is a spanner that was built on a 3D printer. And you'll see it's tiny little pieces all put together to make an item. You can get all sorts of different things. You can see from the Ultimaker 2 piece there, there are always a lot of robots. There's always lots of robots and little figures, like there's an owl. Um, you can do cogs, right? This is where it comes into very, being very useful. Like that item, you couldn't go out and buy that. Okay? In, the, in the past, you would have had to commission a machine shop to build you one of those things, right? Now you can print it. Here's a, a nut and bolt, so you can see that they actually fit together. Okay? That's it for the 3D printed bits. <laughs> We're looking at two. I probably need to speed up a bit. We're going to use the Ultimaker 2, which they also have in Minute, which they've said has proved to be very popular. It's out of the box, ready to go. We're also going to get a RepRap Pro, right? A RepRap Pro, you actually build it yourself. It comes in bits. It can take you about up to 20 hours to build a RepRap Pro. We're going to use it as the first project, okay, to get interest in the, um, in the services. So we want people to actually come in and build. We're going to do Raspberry Pis, which I also have one of them here. So a Raspberry Pi is a little mini computer. This is the first generation one. Linux based. The newer ones can actually do Windows 10, okay? We're going to have Arduino boards. Arduino boards are prototyping boards. I don't know an awful lot about them yet, so uh, they're very popular. They combine with Raspberry Pis at times. We're going to have books, okay? So we're gonna have books, magazines. There's a lot of magazines on this type of thing. There's a Make magazine, okay? We're gonna have something called Little Bits. Little Bits are little electronic components that are color-coded by function, okay? And they connect together magnetically. 
right? They're used in education a lot in the States. We're going to have software around about Adobe type software. We're going to have electronics, so we'll have motors, relays, diodes, all that type of thing. So finally, how are we going to manage it? So if we think a bit like this, it's a space where users can print, borrow items, access software, engage in group learning, and be part of a community, okay? We're doing all that already. So it shouldn't be too much of a stretch. And that's it. Thank you. Um, okay, hi, um, I'm Anya, and I'm here today to talk about open books and the role that they have in Irish academic libraries. Um, open books are an alternative uh, to the traditional textbook. They offer more uh, flexibility in terms of affordability, adaptability, um, accessibility, and so on. Um, and their, very, their use is very widespread in the US, but not so much in Ireland and the UK. At least I couldn't find evidence of it. Um, so I'm interested in uh, whether they would be useful in the Irish context and what our role as librarians might be if they were. Um, I move forward. Oops. Okay, I'm not doing this right. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, thank you. Thanks. Sorry. <laughs> um, okay. Um, so any of us who have worked in academic libraries over the last while are familiar with how much uh, of an impact technological innovation is having um, in our teaching and learning. Um, it's no longer just a matter of um, simplifying or streamlining processes that we use for uh, teaching and learning. Um, increasingly, um, um, technological innovations are impacting on the pedagogy itself, um, impacting on how we learn, what we learn, where we learn, who learns, and so on. Um, and while we're used to having proprietary um, resources, we're used to our databases coming from um, various vendors, um, more and more we're moving towards open resources. Um, the, uh, sorry, um, yesterday Kate Kelly even mentioned that um, the Connell strategy, one of the four key va values is um, the, um, open access. So it's definitely a direction more and more of us are going in. Um, we're choosing these resources because of their accessibility, their um, affordability, um, and the fact that they can be adapted and so on. Um, Okay, so just a very quick word on Creative Commons because it's so central to the success of the open education movement. Um, as we know, many um, authors and content creators, um, their motivations aren't primarily um, economic, um, so they want to be able to get their work out there um, to allow other people to adapt and to reuse it, um, and just to reuse it um, without worrying about copyright law. So that has been um, very central um, in opening up the um, education. Um, so. Uh, some of the areas that we might see this uh, in Ireland um, last year, uh, Trinity's very successful um, massive open online um, course, um, Irish Lives in War and Revolution, um, was used um, primarily by non-TD student, TCD students um, who didn't pay for the course, who didn't get credit for the course, they did it purely out of interest. So that's one of the ways that um, open education really is opening up and we're very um, uh, familiar with um, open educational resources. I particularly like this one because this comes from IT Tala, where they created this tutorial um, on how to avoid online plagiarism um, and gave it an open license and then t UCD came along and adapted it for their own students. So it's a great example of how it's actually working in our libraries already. But, one ex but an example of what isn't working is the open textbooks. So while MOOCs and OERs have been successful and we've been implementing them, um, we haven't been doing it with um, open textbooks so much. Um, so, as Rask says, um, uh, the traditional textbook, um, it, it can be at odds with uh, technological innovation, um, and so it is a challenge and an opportunity for libraries to try and figure how can we update these um, so that, that they're useful for our students. We're all used to um, e-books and uh, so on being added to our collection over the last few years, um, but open books offer a different alternative. Um, they came about in the US uh, for two main reasons. Um, there was a big demand for affordability in the textbook market um, from students themselves. Um, and the second one was the, the degree to which um, emerging pedagogies and emerging technologies were working together to change um, how, how we're, um, how we're um, uh, making these resources available to our students. So there's been different reasons for adopting open books um, in different places, um, but they overlap to some degree. Um, 
So to, to look at the first one, um, the demand for um, affordable textbooks. This was a really big issue in the United States. Um, obviously, we have um, issues with um, expensive textbooks here, but um, it was quite different. Um, over a 30-year period, the uh, textbook costs um, increased 812%. Um, so uh, it really was an urgent issue. Um, there. So students were considered to be something of a captive audience because other people are making the choices of what books they should buy. They had very little negotiating power when it came to actually um, buying them, so the prices were very high. Um, and then up we've seen the recent trend of um, bundling resources with their books so that they're no longer um, as, is as easy to resell. So adding workbooks or adding um, access codes to um, online resources, which means it's harder for the books to be resold. Um, and in addition, um, Obviously, we're having more and more editions, um, new editions of books, the frequency with which new editions are being published. Um, these all right, um, contribute to raising prices, but not necessarily to raising value. Um, so um, a couple of different companies tried to approach this, and one that was particularly successful was Flat World Knowledge. Um, and they, in order to um, be a disruptive influence in the textbook market, um, they um, one of the things they really focused on was affordability and trying to make the, uh, their resources more affordable. So um, their, their model was a freemium model, whereby they made their content available for free on their website. So their books and so on were available in conjunction with the students' lec the, the lectures. The students would be pointed to a particular place um, for their book, um, and it would be available online for free. Um, but then if the student then wanted to buy content in a different format, like if they wanted to buy a cheap black and white version, if they wanted to buy a more expensive um, hardback color version, um, they paid for that. Um, and um, uh, Flat World Knowledge um, reckoned that 45% of their students were buying some amount of content, um, while 55 were continuing to read it online. Um, in 2010, the Business School at Virginia State University worked with Flat World Knowledge because they had found out that only 47% of their students were buying the core texts, um, and they were very worried about this, obviously. Um, and they ran a successful pilot um, with Flat World Knowledge um, to address this. Um, so obviously, the, the question of textbook affordability is a very important one for libraries. Um, in terms of we're all involved in programs for retention and for information literacy and so on. Um, and open books um, are, are, are one way of balancing this inequality that might exist in the classroom when some students can access um, resources that other students can't. Um, and obviously our budgets are a very big impact here as well. Our have a, it has a very uh, big impact on our budgets. Um, none of us are making more money, so um, this um, so open books um, offer a real opportunity um, to, to look at an affordable alternative. Um, in addition to affordability, the other big change that's been happening is the technological innovation, uh, where we've moved, uh, we've kind of transitioned from a model of scarcity to one of abundance. So um, at one time, everybody came to us because we had the resources, and clearly that's not the case anymore. In a new and digital age, um, we're buying with resources like Google, for the attention of students, and so it's no longer the resources that are scarce, but the, the attention of the students that's scarce. Um, so we have to think about our textbooks in a different way because of that. Um, and the emerging technologies, the emerging um, innovations allow us to adapt the content of our textbooks um, to, to reflect that. Um, so lecturers have the, uh, um, in certain, some models, lecturers can buy a generic textbooks and adapt it to their own student needs. They can adapt it in terms of um, adding local knowledge, uh, deleting irrelevant knowledge, um, reordering texts and so on. Um, in South Africa, there's a Sayavela initiative, which has used this particularly well uh, to include cultural and geographical knowledge um, for the students. They also took into account that a lot of the students are using English as their second and third language. Uh, so being able to adapt that uh, content was very important to them. Um, so yes, our students have uh, different expectations now um, because their attention is so scarce and because it takes um, considerable effort to get their attention away from Google and towards us. Um, adapting the content so that it's directly relevant to them has definitely got an advantage so that we're, making, we're designing textbooks that fit the course rather than vice versa. I'm going to zip through this because um, before I go running out of time. But um, so how does this apply to us, our libraries and our institutions? Um, so because of the content of um, 
open books will mainly come from third parties, other lecturers and academics, rather than from ourselves. So the library has um, an opportunity to be facilitators, probably more, um, more so. Um, so in 2011, Temple University were an example of a university that tried this. They offered a $1,000 um, grant to different individuals um, to eliminate their current uh, proprietary textbook and to replace it with a non-traditional alternative. Um, they received 11 proposals and they ended up with 11 successful projects um, in doing this. So I think many of us will be familiar with champions in our own institutions, people who are already doing things like this very, very very similar. Um, and um, uh, we've all had champions who've helped us see through different projects um, purely because of interest um, rather than for financial gain. Um, so the, this motivation I thought summed it up for one of the lectures that I worked with. Um, he said he was primarily motivated um, oops, by his uh, the need of his students more than anything else. So I'll finish with this one. Um, so the role of the library, as well as being facilitators, which we definitely have the opportunity to be, um, in terms of, uh, obviously, everybody's finances are quite stripped, but we have other opportunities in terms of reviewing licenses to see whether information can be included um, or to help people find alternatives <laughs> from open source um, sources. Um, but as well as that, um, we have to think in terms of, in, rather than just um, individual writers, um, thinking in terms of team writers, so that when people are developing books, they're developing them for modules that can move on, um, but that we would be very much part of that team, that librarians, as um, teaching librarians, there's a lot of information that we want to be embedding, and, and that's a direction that we might encourage it to go in. Um, sorry, I'm going to stop now, but um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.